Hello, I'm Alexis, and thank you for joining the Grace Point online experience. We hope this message inspires you, hope it helps you build your faith, and draws you closer to Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the message. In 1896, a pastor from Topeka, Kansas, by the name of Charles Sheldon, wrote a book, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And that book sold 30 million copies. 1896, that's a lot of books being sold. And the whole point of the question was, when you're faced with a a decision, a moral decision, difficult decision, ask that question, what would Jesus do? That was 1896, about 100 years later, Uh, A youth group, I found out a youth group in Minnesota started this question, what would Jesus do? Anybody remember in the 90s the the rubber uh, bracelet WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? It's a great question to ask, but this month of August, we're asking a different question. We're asking, what would Jesus undo? What would Jesus undo? The things that we're doing in our lives, issues, and this is just for Christians, there are things that we need to stop doing, And these four issues that we're talking about, Jesus confronts it pretty harshly, pretty directly, pretty intensely. uh, intensely. I mean, he was just intense of responding because these four issues break the heart of Jesus. God, God hates them, and he doesn't want his children to have these issues part of our life. Now, this series... It's difficult to hear, and believe me, it's difficult to teach. Very blunt, very direct, kind of like Jesus. But I think this series is is a good opportunity for those of us who say we're followers of Jesus to take a deep, hard, honest look into the mirror. Say, do I have this in my life? Am I in a season in my life where this shows up? Am I in a period of my life, or or am I in, in the habit of this being who I am? And it needs to stop including me. In fact, I, I, thought, I thought when I was studying this that it was going to go this direction. About halfway through my, my studying, God made a hard turn, and he didn't tell me. And he was like, wait a second, you're going here? I don't, I don't want you to go here. That's uncomfortable there. And God was like, it's not about you. Just deliver the message. And later on in this message, I needed to make a confession because I'm in, in it with you, all these areas. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about the thing that God hates, wants to undo, is the issue of hypocrisy. Oh, we, we, we say we're this, we show we're this, and we're not really that. And our, our walk does not match our talk. But it's so harmful. Number one hindrance of Christianity are Christians being hypocrites. Turn, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to unpack part two today. If you have a copy of God's Word or a tablet, you can turn to Matthew chapter 15. We'll unpack it. But while you're turning there, you probably notice I have something interesting on this table. Underneath this cloth is a food item. And this food item, when I, when I reveal it to you, some in this room are going to say, oh, yeah, can I have one? Can I have one? And others will have the opposite reaction. They're going to see this food item and go, ooh. Yuck, I don't even want to touch one at all, at all. But what is going to be revealed in just a moment is a picture symbolic of the issue that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about today is hollow worship, hollow worship. Now, to illustrate that, I present to you a food item called Twinkies. Twinkies. Some of you are like that glorious yellow cake filled with goodness. And I would say, no, it's not. This, this is a picture of you can fill your mouth and fill your belly with Twinkies and you may feel full, 
but it's not going to do you any good. There's nothing of real lasting value here. It's nothing. It's empty. It's hollow. It's a Twinkie. A Twinkie. And when we come to worship God, many times, what we're offering to God is hollow, is empty, is vain, is Twinkie worship. That may fill us up, it may you know, like, yeah, yeah, and God's going, no, I don't want that. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Now, some of you have already jumped ahead where you think we're going to go with this. You're like, oh, yeah, about time our pastor's going to deal with, uh, you know, those, those Twinkie worship songs that are sung today. There's nothing there. Slow your roll. We may not go there. We may not go there. In chapter 15 of Matthew, Jesus has some guests, the Pharisees. And the religious leaders come to him. He said this, and some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked him, I'm sure they're shaking their heads, why do your disciples, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands before they eat. Now, how many of you, when you were a child, got in trouble from trying to eat at the dinner table without your hands being washed? My mom's in the room, so my hand must go up. <clears throat> and there's a whole story that I'm not going to tell today. I got in big trouble because I, I had the stupidity to sit next to her at the dinner table. Let me see your hands. No. <laughs> now, the issue that the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law had, had nothing to do with physical hygiene. Nothing to do with physical hygiene at all. Like you're eating, but you, you know, germs and potential disease. That was not on the radar. As devout Jews, the whole washing of the hands, they were talking about the ceremonial cleansing that was a huge deal to them. The ceremonial cleansing. And, and if you were a devout Jew, you pretty much put all of life into two categories. Clean and unclean. There are animals that were clean, and there are animals that were unclean. There are food that were clean. You can eat that food, but you can't eat that food. That's unclean. You can touch this, but do not touch that. And even your body health-wise, if you were healthy, you were clean. If you were sick or you had some disease, you were unclean. And in that mindset, in that culture, if you were unclean in any area of your life, you were defiled, It's a strong word. You were defiled and you were not eligible to worship God. So they've seen Jesus teaching. His disciples didn't do the ceremonial cleansing. They're defiled. You can't worship God. Now this whole ceremonial cleansing, uh, there there was a process that that became, you know, someone had a good idea, became a, a tradition, then it became like a law. Like you have to do it this way. And this is what it was. They would have to wash their hands with what was called a quarter of a log of clean water. Now, what was a quarter of a log? It was one and a half um, eggshells of clean water. Not a lot of water. One and a half eggshells. And there was a way that you had to clean with, with, with that water. You had to have elbows out, hands together, fingers pointing up. And then you had somebody pour the clean water on your unclean hands before a meal and uh, let the water flow down and make sure it hit the ground, you know, because it can't touch you through your hands. And then after you had some water poured on with a, with a fist, you had to rub your f- hands and fingers. That's, that you couldn't just do this. Uh-uh, that's not the proper way. Fist to open palm. That's how you clean. And then you're not done because now you still have dirt. With, mixed with water. And so then you had to put your hands down, fingers pointing down, and someone pour some more clean water to ceremonially cleanse your hands, and then they were clean. Now you were eligible to eat in worship of God. And here's what they did. They, they would ceremonially clean their hands before a meal, good devout Jew, before every meal, and including... Any change of course in the meal, you had to clean your hands again. It looked good. It looked holy. 
but it was just spiritually symbolic that back in the day someone said, hey, let's do this, and it became a tradition, and tradition became a law. Had nothing to do with germs and hygiene. So they say, Jesus, why are you breaking the, you know, the, the, the tradition of the elders? And you're eating without washing your hands. Well, Jesus replies. In verse 3, he says, Jesus says, well, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Why are you breaking the command of God? Then Jesus in the passage tells a command of God. The Bible says, God says to honor your father and mother, but you Pharisees, you take what you have, the resources that you have, and you, you know, dedicate them to God. They are now dedicated to God. And so then if your parent comes to you in need, and they, they need some help, they need some, some resources, you're like, sorry, Mom. Sorry, Father. We would love to help you, but everything we have has been dedicated to the Lord. So we can't give it to you. In verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, he said. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Then he quotes Isaiah. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Their worship is vain. Their worship is empty. Their worship is twinky worship. Oh, they think there's substance there, but there's nothing of significance there at all. When it comes to hollow worship, here's several things that we can learn from this passage that hollow worship elevates. Hollow, hollow worship, for your notes, elevates human tradition over God's word. Human tradition, there's something about the human DNA. We find ourselves always lining up over a period of time, and then it becomes our tradition. And then that becomes the, the, what's, what's law, what's acceptable. And it's something repeated over and over and over again. Probably started out with good intentions, a good idea, but over time it just became a tradition. This is what we do, this is how we do it, this is why we do it, and this is what we do. And they were elevating their tradition, their human tradition, over God's word. And what I've, I've learned over many, many years of, of being a Christian and 33 years of being a pastor is that the human mind, we have, we have the capacity with a PhD in rationalization and justification. We can justify anything. And then we kind of like, well, there's, it's, in the, it's in the God's word somewhere. And now human tradition surpasses God's word. The second thing that human worship, uh, hollow worship elevates is this. The sur it elevates the surface over substance. The surface over substance. Now, if you understand God's word and the teaching of God's word, God always goes to the heart, the heart issue. Oh, yeah, you can be doing all the right things on the outside, but if your heart is, is not there, God just discounts all that. Many times he says, just forget, worship, forget your sacrifices, just don't even bring your sacrifices because your heart is hardened, your heart is wicked, your heart is not there. But on the surface, oh, cleanse me, please. I got to have some ceremony cleansing. Oh, do it again. Okay, I look good. Oh, is, isn't, aren't they holy? Oh, they must love God. An elevation of surface over real substance. Another thing hollow worship elevates is human opinions over God's opinions. Well, I think human opinions over God's opinions. And the longer we're churched, and I'll be guilty of this, is my opinions are God's opinions. What's your problem? Twinkie worship, Twinkie worship. Twinkie worship. Speaking for myself, I've been guilty, guilty, and guilty of this. Many times I don't even realize it. I don't even realize it. So Jesus is done teaching. The crowd disperses. The disciples come up to Jesus. 
And they came to him and asked, uh, Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Jesus, do, do you realize that you ticked them off? They're mad when they heard what you said, when they heard what they said. My experience is this, is that we are often, Christians, we are often offended when our opinions, when our opinion is questioned or not adopted. I am so guilty. It's like if you guys would all have the same opinions as me, everybody would get along. Their world would work the way it should work. And I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that. Because I'm so convinced of my opinions. Especially if I think God's on my side. He's not on your side. You can't change your opinions. But many times, like, don't you question my opinion when it comes to worship and, and, and God and, 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 and all that we're talking about, you know, corporately and stuff? Whoa, whoa, whoa. But many times, if it's not adopted, then we got a problem. We got a problem. Again, I've also learned this, and guilty of this, is most opinions when it comes to worship and church and all that are tradition-based, not scriptural-based, tradition-based. Here, here's some examples that we have opinions about how worship should look, feel, be, you know, displayed. We, we have opinions about this is the way church should do and happen because when I grew up, this is how church happened. And, th- and this, or I've been doing church a certain way for a certain li- time. And you know what? I like this. This fits me. So it should fit everybody. And it's not biblically based. It's just tradition based. It's not my tradition about church. Style, style of worship, style of how do you do church? Well, I have thoughts. Great. Golf clap for Barry. But it's tradition based. Environment. This is how the worship environment should look like and feel like, and, and, and the lights or no lights. Or I grew up with stained glass windows. It's not a church unless there's stained glass windows, and it has to cross, has to be on the platform, not on the wall. And we have opinions about environments, you know, all sorts of things. Song selection. Oh man, now it's on. Like we need to sing these songs because these these songs have substance to the to them and not the, these other you know newer songs. Seven eleven, seven words, eleven times. I've heard that. It's not funny, um, and, but uh, it's just there's the battle lines. But then there's dress. Like I'm not sure if he's a real pastor if he doesn't teach with a suit and tie on. <laughs> you know because first opinions three sixteen says when you come to church you got to wear your Sunday best. It's in the Bible somewhere. Man, I have just, I, I've been guilty of this, and I don't think I'm the only one. Jesus, the most distinct part of Scripture that Jesus refers to worship, he says this in John chapter 4. He says, the true, true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Let me unpack that. Worshiping in the Spirit, capital S, meaning we are led in worship by the Holy Spirit. We are directed in how we worship by the Holy Spirit. We are moved by the Holy Spirit in how we worship. All right, everything's coming through, through the Holy Spirit. I'm not moved by, that's a cool song. I like that song. Okay, great, I like it, but that's not worshiping in the spirit. It's not worshiping in the spirit. I'm like, oh, man, you know, whew, man, I, just, I just really like that band, man. They got a groove going on or whatever. Or I'm playing, this is really good. No, that's, that's play, playing by, by skill, which is awesome. But worship in the spirit, the Holy Spirit is moving me to worship. Not even the people up here. They lead us sometimes, hopefully all the time, but hopefully they're worshiping in the Spirit, they're playing in the Spirit and draws us to God. But it's all about worshiping in the Spirit and worshiping in truth. And truth means what we're, see- we're saying, what we're hearing is true. It's from Scripture. And it's also in truth that I genuinely, authentically 
believe that and agree with that. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. But there are things that come up that hinder us worshiping in the spirit. Things that hinder us worshiping in spirit. What is it? My sinful heart. My sinful attitude. My expectations. Well, I thought they would, or I, I didn't think they would do that. It's all about my expectations. It hindered my, my opinions can be so strong that we, it hinders the Spirit of God. So I have a confession to make. That I did not anticipate in studying that God would want me to apply the message. I can't stand that when he does that. The handful of times I have visited my daughter's church in Virginia, I have left so sinful. My attitude, my opinions, because of the style of worship, the style of teaching, and then I would utter my frustration to my wife and to a few other people. And in studying, God was like, now you went to church but because of your attitude and your opinions. You gave me a Twinkie. So then a few weeks back when we were in Virginia watching our grandson and my daughter and her husband went to uh, Europe for a mission trip, and it was like, well, where are we going to go to church? And my mom was like, well, we're not going to that church. And she won't know. And then the Spirit of God started working on me. And God was like, almost, almost audible. I'm a former Baptist, so audible would really freak me out. <laughs> it was almost audible, God saying, you honor your daughter and your son-in-law, and you go to their church. I'm like, Candy, we're, we're going to their church. She goes, okay. My next step, I had to start praying. <laughs> From my attitude, and my heart, and I prayed multiple times on Saturday. Then Sunday morning came around, I had to pray again. I was like, God, I, I, I don't want that attitude. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to respond that way. I don't want to sin. So we got uh, Landon put in the car, got ready to go, and I went, well, I know they won't play certain songs I really connect with, so I'm going to play songs prior to service. I'm going to start worship now, and I'll pick these songs, and I wasn't doing it in spite. I was doing it with seriousness. I, I want to prepare my heart for worship, so the whole ride to their church on the freeway, I put on worship songs that really connect to me, and for the first time, I authentically worshiped at that church because my heart was in alignment and I worshiped in the spirit and in truth. And I was so under conviction that I needed to repent. And I'm going to say it publicly and please just keep this between me and you. Okay. please, if you know my daughter, please don't say anything. But I, I, I needed to come public with that because my attitudes were sinful. Here's a couple of truths that God really drilled into me. Truth number one is that church is a great church. They teach God's word. They love my kids. They love my grandson. That's a God-honoring church. Second truth, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. I was wrong. My heart was wrong. My attitude was wrong. And I repented from it. And now I've gone public, so I've got to keep doing that every time I visit. And I want to. I don't want hollow worship. I don't want God going, man, your body's in church, but your heart is far from me because you're not getting your way. There's another truth that I want to present as we wrap this 
this message up. It's the truth for your notes. It's, I find this so true. Is that hollow worship rarely comes from those who have truly grasped God's grace. I'm not saying it never, you know, never happens, but it rarely happens. Hollow worship rarely happens. My experience has been is someone who truly grasps God's grace, not intellectually, but experientially. Last week I shared of a church that I, that I follow from, from Las Vegas, Corn, uh, I mean, uh, Central Church. I got too many churches I follow. Central Church. It started years ago as a little Baptist church for, for, for decades and decades. And about 20 years ago, they made a, a strategic decision like, here we are in Sin City and we got a church club. We got to be a church that reaches our, our city and, and bring the light of the gospel to this dark area. And they made some drastic changes. People left. But, but then God started doing a work and got, started kind of changing people's lives. And they went from hundreds to thousands and thousands upon thousands. Now it's tens of thousands. And, and, and I've studied online, watched and saw testimonies of prostitutes getting saved by the gospel and, and becoming disciples of Jesus and pimps uh, cashing in that lifestyle and become followers of Jesus. People who have drug and alcohol addiction uh, have gotten freedom because of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus. And so then a, years ago, a couple years ago, we, we went there, my wife and I went there, and I was like, I want to see live what's going on, what I've seen online. And it was even more overwhelming going in live to thousands of people were hungry, were craving, were sponges for worship in song and worship in the teaching of God's word. They just like could not wait for it. And during the, the singing part of worship, it was as loud as I've ever experienced ever before. My shirt was moving to the beat of the bass drum and, and I was just like but I was overwhelmed as I'm looking around seeing people just authentically worshiping God and shouting praise to God like I've never heard before and what I really burned in my mind's memory was these grown men who had the scars of a hard life and their arms were tatted up arms in the air screaming worship to God with tears streaming down their face and I leaned over to my wife. I, got, I had to get close to her ear because it was loud. And I said, they can worship like that because they truly get grace. It's not just a head knowledge of God's grace. They've experienced it. And I'm like, I want to worship like that. And it, it, it altered, it impacted and altered my worship. Last Sunday after church, I'm home recovering from preaching. And my brother texts me his pastor's sermon that morning and he says oh this is great man Chad did a great job and he should watch it and so I did it had nothing to do with what we're talking about today but then near the end Chad said something so powerful so convicting to me that I, I wanted to share it Chad said this he says if you grew up in a home if you grew up in a home that taught right from wrong a solid home that you had both parents who loved Jesus and, and you had parents who took you to church and at an early age you experienced the gospel and salvation of Jesus Christ. If you grew up like that, spiritually speaking, you were born on third base. I mean, we still have to choose Jesus for ourselves, but we were born on third base spiritually compared to people who have grown up in a home that the normal was dysfunction, the normal was destruction, the normal was arguments and fight, fighting, and then there's no basis of morality, and they didn't know how to live in unity with one another, and they did not know Jesus. Compared to those people who grew up like that, you, you were born on third base, and I'm watching, I'm going, I was born on third base. And I know grace and I know the right things but I love being around people and God is blessing our church more and more with people who you've experienced grace and I want to worship like you we're going to close today with two songs but there's an antidote to hollow worship there's an antidote to Twinkie to worship. Though and the, the words are going to be familiar to you if you grew up in church. It's from an old song. 
and I put a little twist on it. Here's the antidote for hollow worship. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth, and I've added, and the things at church, in church, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. His grace. It's so easy, and I've been there, I've done it, I just confessed my issue just last month. It's so easy to put our eyes on people, put our eyes on style, put our eyes on lights or no lights or drums or no drums, or, and we get our eyes on all sorts of things. We don't offer God authentic worship. It's hollow. It's empty. Our heart is not there. So before we have a chance to finish with hopefully authentic worship, maybe some of you need to toss your, your, your Twinkie worship down away. I want to remind you about Jesus, to look at Jesus. I want to remind you or tell you for the first time that Jesus is our rock. Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our deliverer. He's our defense. He's our shield. He's our salvation. He's our shepherd. And he's our savior. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the true vine. He is everything for us. He is life. He is the light of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lion of Judah. He is our protector. He is our Jehovah Jireh provider. He is our sustainer. Jesus is the Alpha. He is the Omega, which means he's the beginning and the end. And Jesus fills all the middle. And I want to remind you that Jesus is the soon coming, conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. It is Him who we worship. Let's fix our eyes on Him, not on our traditions, not on our upbringing, not on our opinions, but on Jesus. Would you stand with me before we have a chance to sing? God, today, would you hear our authentic worship? that we would put, a, put a, aside our pride, our arrogance, our opinions, our tradition, and just focus on authentically worshiping you because you deserve it. So in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the name which has all power, we say, hear our worship, amen.